you can speak of, um, let's say Cameroon today, uh, as it was, uh, our, that territory was uh, 2000 years ago, or even the United States for that matter, or any country. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, everybody who's looked carefully at uh, Angus Madison work uh, can say that he devoted his life doing his best uh, to, 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 to be consistent uh, in, in, in drawing boundaries and coming up with these numbers, which are amazing. Uh, I put this chart up there, which uh, I've done using Madison's data uh, to make a simple point, which is that for really nearly 1800 years, the entire world was poor. It's kind of shocking. Uh, and most people tend to forget this. Um, if you measure income per capita in any place around the world a thousand years ago, as Angus Madison tried to do, and I think did, um, you would see that it was basically the same. It didn't matter where you were in the world. Of course, there were always rich people uh, everywhere. But uh, if you use the concept of uh, per capita income and you measure it, you would see that um, there was uh, uh, democratization of poverty, if one could say so, for, for a very long time. Until, until of course, uh, the 1800s, uh, something happens, and you can see on the on the on the charts um, the most the, the, the small group of countries that really took off were the Western offshoots, and then uh, the West the Western European countries. Uh, what happened there? Um, the obvious uh, answer is the Industrial Revolution, but but um, Madison is very strong in his work, uh, arguing that it has been really the birth of modern capitalism. Uh, the, 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 at least uh, the version that, 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 that we know today. Um, and, and it has helped uh, uh, all countries in the world, not all countries, but most, many countries um, get into industrial upgrading, um, improving productivity, and then moving from low, uh, low productivity activities like uh, subsistence agriculture into light manufacturing, and then more sophisticated and higher value addition uh, uh, activities. And of course, uh, the US is uh, one of the best case of uh, what is viewed as successful industrial upgrade. Now, um, some countries in, in the past century, the past 70 years or so have also done well. I pick um, uh, South Korea because uh, after World War II, South Korea was really a basket case. Uh, much uh, in the situation of many African countries today, or even worse. Um, if you go back and you look at uh, South Korean statistics uh, uh, in the 50s and then af after the Korean War, well, things were really, really uh, bad. But I wanted to show, I would like to show a few pictures quickly and then I'll, I'll get into, I'll spend the remainder of my time discussing Africa. Uh, this is a place in, in, in Seoul, uh, a well-known place, which for many decades was a, a, a large uh, agglomeration of slums. And then in the 1970s, they decided that they would do something about it. And they, there was a river, there, so they decided to remove the river and to kind of build a highway through and over the slums. This is the 1970s. This is the same place in the 1980s, um, on the South Korean version of capitalism, uh, you can see that they substantially improved the quality of, of that place. Uh, the slums have disappeared. They remove even the river that was there, and then they build these highways uh, as their own vision of, of, their, of their capitalism. And this is the same exact place uh, a few years later, uh, the same exact place where the mayor at the time, uh, Mayor Lee Byung-bak, uh, decided that it was time to bring back the river which they had uh, diverted and then make this place uh, really friendly and uh, 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 as a symbol of uh, South Korea having used capitalism wisely uh, to create jobs and create wealth and prosperity and, uh, 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 and even getting into sustainable growth and development. Um, so it's an interesting example of how capitalism has worked well, I think, in some places. I can also show you this picture of Shenzhen. Uh, in the 1980s, Shenzhen was a sleepy small village uh, of uh, several thousand fishermen near Guangzhou, uh, in, in Southeast China. 
Um, this is a picture of the place in the 1980s. And this is the same exact place uh, today. And again, you can see how the Chinese brand of capitalism, even though they don't call it capitalism, they call it uh, socialism with uh, Chinese characteristic. Uh, this is what they've done uh, with uh, taking into account, uh, uh, um, I mean, using the system very well, globalization that Paul Collier talked about, and then uh, uh, bringing uh, people into the process, being inclusive. When I say inclusion, I tend personally, because I'm a microeconomist, to think mostly about good jobs. Uh, I think that the more good jobs you create and bring, uh, that gives people uh, uh, possibilities and opportunities to improve their lives. Now, let me end this series of pictures by showing um, a couple of pictures of my own country, Cameroon, my beloved country, Cameroon. This is the capital city, Yaoundé, in the 1950s under colonial uh, uh, administration. Uh, Cameroon was not yet an independent country. This is a famous place in Yaoundé, the colonial market at the center of the capital city uh, in the 50s. And this is the same exact place today. Um, of course, my point is that you don't see the kind of changes and transformation that the capitalism brought or was able to bring in other parts of the world there. Uh, uh, and you can run this uh, uh, through many other African countries and you would see the same uh, uh, non-transformation. Uh, and you can visually see that capitalism has not been uh, mastered and used uh, and exploited in the way that uh, other countries have done. In fact, some people look at these pictures and they even say that on the colonial <laughs> regime, the picture looked better than, than this one. I wouldn't venture uh, uh, into that, but uh, my point is uh, capitalism has an Achilles heel that um, needs really seriously to be discussed and text. Um, in, in the paper which I share, and I know the participant to this workshop, not the external audience, but uh, the economists, the participants have received the draft. I go through um, a discussion of why I think that capitalism, um, even in the US, even in places where it has been successful, uh, in recent decades has really uh, lost its way a little bit. And I looked at the typical five pillars that uh, advocates and proponents of capitalism put forward uh, to justify, um, um, uh, to, to make the case that uh, it's still the best system in the world. I personally tend to agree that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit like what Churchill said about democracy. Uh, it, it, it may not be the best, but uh, everything else seems to be, for now, less worse. But what is capitalism and what is the degree of capitalism? We can go through that. But I won't spend time on this. Let me just say that I put these five pillars here simply to um, make the comment that even in the most advanced capitalist countries today, these pillars are on the threat. Um, uh, 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 let me just pick competition, which is really at the core, the essence of capitalism. Um, there's a lot of uh, interesting, important work, uh, including empirical work done by people like Thomas Philippon, uh, for instance, at New York University, showing that uh, competition, uh, uh, the intensity of competition has decreased dramatically in the United States of America over the past decades, uh, for instance. Uh, and, and those who, who strongly advocate for, uh, for, for capitalism should certainly uh, uh, go through the criteria and see whether they are still valid as the way we think they, they should be. So let me uh, go through this quickly. I also put up this uh, chart, uh, which I wanted to, which I discussed in the paper uh, a little bit, because uh, to me, it goes to the core of what's uh, the fragility of capitalism. Um, it is a system which is prone to shocks, to risk, uh, because it encourages risk taking. It encourages collaboration between the private sector and government. And when government work well, you may have some sense of uh, good neutral uh, regulation taking place, uh, but it's not always the case, not even in the most advanced economies. Uh, but the point here in this uh, chart is that when there is a shock like the pandemic that we, we are still uh, going through, 
um, uh, you have two types of uh, reactions and possibilities uh, between the poor and the non-poor. This is uh, the dotted line on this graph just shows how uh, the poor, the non-poor, sorry, uh, um, can, can maintain their consumption even when there is a shock. They can do so uh, because uh, they typically have access to savings or to insurance uh, or, uh, or to other financial products, uh, which makes um, them uh, less vulnerable uh, to, to, to shocks. Yes, the income may come down, which is the solid black line uh, uh, at point A, there is a shock where the income comes down. Um, and then they use their savings uh, or some, some other means like insurance, and then they maintain their consumption. Um, unfortunately, you don't have that with uh, the poor. The poor, which are represented, uh, the story is at the bottom of this chart. When their income goes down, they simply don't have savings. They don't have access to credit. They don't have access to insurance. And then um, uh, by the time uh, there's a policy, a government policy response, if there is one that actually reaches them, well, uh, some of the poor have actually been forced to sell their assets, to sell their most productive assets, um, which makes them uh, worse off. Even when the policy response comes in, it's a bit too late because they already lost the means of production. So I think that's one of the biggest issues with the current version of capitalism. Uh, it's inability to help uh, poor people uh, deal uh, with shocks and, and, and not be forced to sell the, the, the most productive asset. But let's end with Africa. As I said and hinted earlier when I showed the pictures uh, of uh, Cameroon and the lack of uh, transformation, um, I think that Africa is the region of the world that has least benefited from capitalism. Um, one reason, unfortunately, uh, which we cannot avoid is the weak public governance and the politics and the authoritarian regimes. Africa is still the place in the world where the international community seems to be okay with that uh, authoritarian rulers, some of them have been there for uh, three, four decades uh, in power, not delivering, not being accountable to anything, but still running the economy, running the system. They have their family members, their wives, their brothers, their nephews, their sons and daughters, and so on, their friends, uh, who basically uh, confiscate the national economy. It's very difficult for the people in Africa then, uh, who, by the way, uh, believe mainly, most, most of them, I think, believe in capitalism. In fact, one of my friends was even telling me that uh, um, if you read uh, the, the, the work of uh, historians like Im Bantuta, who came to Afri Sub Saharan Africa even before the Westerners, um, that uh, the people of Africa uh, knew about capitalism and practiced capitalism before Adam Smith wrote his book. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a continent where people strongly believe in exchanges in trade and finance, uh, but in this, when you have political system where there is no transparency and no accountability, it's very difficult to have the kind of capitalism that you've seen elsewhere delivering uh, prosperity and, and social peace. Um, looking in particular to the market structure uh, of a capitalist system in, in, in Africa, um, the players are typically uh, a few government officials uh, but with a weak administration. It's a kind of a paradox. You have three, four people who are basically uh, uh, on top of everything and their signature, their word, uh, the yes or no decides whether this industry gets, uh, this, this company gets a loan uh, or not, or gets uh, the, 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 the tax rate, uh, everything uh, can be negotiated uh, uh, by, by a small group of people who set uh, 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 will make this decision. And then you have a very weak administration and then with a, a strong people. Um, you have some business people in that context who understand that in order to succeed, they need to be political connected. So they establish uh, you know, non-transparent relationship with, with people in power and that changes everything. Uh, unfortunately, the civil society part of business uh, which typically works well in other places, including in the United States, for instance, 
in the United States, for instance, like the Chamber of Commerce, uh, they don't work well in Africa, in most of Africa, because they are heavily politicized. Uh, trade unions, uh, which have worked well in Europe or in some other places uh, to, to help capitalism function, um, are, are also politicized and, and weakened in most of Africa, uh, I would say, except uh, uh, with the exception of, of, of South Africa, where, by the way, they, they may also be playing, they're playing a very good role, but also in terms of uh, maybe uh, uh, the, the wage bargaining uh, uh, discussion, not necessarily playing the role that would allow jobs to be created. You also have, of course, the dualism of the informality. You have a huge informal sector uh, in almost everything. You have visible and invisible business entities. Uh, the competition is perhaps the point which, uh, where Africa's brand of capitalism is, is the most uh, peculiar. Uh, a lot of monopolies, uh, a, a number of olig oligopolies, um, some of them visible, others not visible in the sense that you know, in many African countries, if you're a business person and you get into a nice niche uh, where you're making money, you know very quickly that uh, some political people will come to you and you will have to have them as shareholders or partners uh, or, or else. And, and, and if that political person is the wife of the president or the brother of the president, well, you can imagine the kind of distortion that, 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 that occurs. And, and, and of course, you cannot have competition real competition uh, 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 as we have in textbooks uh, in, in places like that. So um, let me not uh, take too much time because I've already gone overboard, uh, maybe in 30 seconds, wrap up by saying that um, on the Africa's branch of capitalism, the rules are very often unstable. The laws are regulations often, often outdated or uncertain. Sometimes the things which are in the books are not really what matters including for judges, uh, because they're not independent uh, always. You have policy reversal. You, government can decide something today and then change their mind the next day because uh, they decide this because they wanted to have an IFMF loan uh, or disbursement from the World Bank. And then a few weeks after they got it, then they go back and change uh, their mind and, and that changes everything. Um, and of course, you have jobless Africa. I won't go through this graph except to say that the blue lines are the percentages of people in Africa working in agriculture, whatever that is, uh, because they put the statisticians in Africa tend to put in agriculture uh, things that they cannot measure. Uh, but the point here is that most people in Africa, the labor force is constrained and trapped in really low productive acti activities, whether rural agriculture or informal activities in, in, in urban areas. And of course, you can have a, a sustained growth and inclusive growth and poverty reduction with, with these kind of issues. Um, let me end by with these uh, two, three quick points to say that we cannot save capitalism in Africa if we don't think about the politics, about political governance, about transparency and accountability. Um, and uh, people like Roger Meissen at the University of Chicago, the Nobel Prize winner, has been very strong uh, uh, when on his work in, Af in his work on Africa in recent years uh, with local governance, uh, saying that uh, it's really the way to, uh, to, to, to build competition, to start competition by strong decentralization uh, 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 that works, uh, 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 allowing regional government, local government to have the kind of uh, regional industrial policy, local industrial policy, for instance. I think that financing is also very important. Um, we can get go through that uh, during uh, the Q&A uh, session. And then finally, lastly, last point, I think strongly that uh, uh, the creation of enclaves of excellence are essential because the problems in Africa are so many, so pervasive that it is almost impossible to any government uh, to try to solve all of them at the same time. Uh, you would need, uh, I don't know, 50 years uh, to do all the reforms that the World Bank doing business identify for your country. The way to do it um, pragmatically and quickly is to create enclaves of excellence that the industrial district, the special economic zone, industrial parks and so on, which create the Marshallian externality and can help you build clusters 
and, and achieve economies of scale, which is good for foreign investors and also domestic investors. And then in a world where most of uh, trade, uh, certainly manufacturing being done through global value chain, it's critically important to find ways to connect Africans, SMEs, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises into global value chain, because otherwise you have political economy issues and you have people, uh, as I've seen in Democratic Republic of Congo, where the business community uh, demonstrate on the streets against foreign investors, because they think that they are basically in bed with the politicians and that uh, they are making money, but they are not uh, building the economy. So thank you very much. I'm sorry I've been too long, Paul, but uh, this is such an exciting topic. Thank you very much, Celeste. Now, that was great. So the way forward is devolve governance and pockets of excellence. And of course, pockets of excellence then get copied. Let's pass straight over to Stefan Durkon uh, to pick the, the baton up. Stefan. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I, um, I have a few slides and I, and I will really do my best to talk uh, much shorter. Uh, it was worth listening to Celeste. And I think what I will add to it, I think is maybe trying on some of the things he was touching on, a bit of extra structure on it and a bit my take on it. And probably um, maybe also suggesting, I do see pockets of change already. It's not just waiting for these pockets of excellence and actually focusing a bit more on that. So um, I'll explain the, the title will get clear a bit later on. But, you know, uh, when Paul asked me quite late, it was only yesterday, to, to actually get involved in this uh, conversation, um, the first thing I quickly did is actually, well, let me quickly go to the dictionary and to make sure that what I'm actually talking about actually makes sense in terms of uh, what the concepts are. And, you know, this is what the Oxford Dictionary will tell you. And the three things in red are quite obvious. It's something to do with political economic system uh, where the control of trade and uh, where trade and industry are essentially controlled by private owners of, of profit rather than by the state. But it's what is quite important here is to um, realize that you know these writers of the Oxford Dictionary, they clearly have their own context in mind. They have their own structures in mind. And that actually is quite a striking thing that we see this here because in somehow or another, even this statement, this definition tends to assume there is somehow a state sufficiently separate from private interest, some form of an accountable state that exists there. It's a bit like, you know, as if the state we describe here is a bit what North and Weingast and Wallis were calling, you know, an open access order, okay? And it's this assumption there is somehow that separate state allows then actually capitalism where trade and industry are controlled by, uh, by private owners uh, and, and work for profit, can actually then kind of um, thrive. But in that system, even in open access order, and they define it essentially, almost as the word say, an order in society where entry is possible, where don't things get captured fundamentally uh, beforehand, and where, whether it's in economics or in politics, people can enter and, 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 and we get um, progress through, through that process. You know, there is an element of rules of the games that are, are defined here. Now, it is quite important that these things exist, and it will lead me later on and, and touching on some things that Celestine mentioned in terms of, you know, how to think of the African context here. Because, you know, it's not that there is no capitalist zeal, entrepreneurial zeal all over the world. In fact, there is enormous amounts of it in Africa. What possibly is different is somehow that nature of the order that exists there, because the zeal is there, you know, and... But you shouldn't forget if an entrepreneur goes to bed at night and starts dreaming, the entrepreneur is probably not going to dream of, oh, I dream that it's perfect competition so that I can work as a small atomistic agent and everybody is equal and nobody can ever get power. An entrepreneur goes to bed at night and thinks, I'm going to dominate the market. I'm going to dominate. I'm going to be a big player in the game. I'm going to be uh, defeat and kill off all my competitors. And so this is quite important to understand that you know, the assumption that there is something there as an accountable state next to it is quite important. So this, if you don't think broadly speaking, you know, and, and, and I'm not going to try to give, and I'm, this is anyway so generalized quite wrong, but if you think, you know, Western capitalism, in fact, American capitalism, as Celestin was referring to, you know, it went through these stages, stages where, you know, where we had the age of national, uh, uh, national monopolies, when the Robert Barons 
came back in America, where initially there was a lot of liberalization, but then actually the reaction of the state was a way of correcting it. Then we had the age of managerial capitalism and also global capitalism later on emerging in it, where maybe the bounds were set nationally, but globally we're liberalizing in the whole state, uh, thing. But where we again now get pressures of a correcting of the state towards it. But meanwhile, we, we're reaching the first part of the 21st century with possibly global oligopolies and monopolies, think of what's happening in tech, tech and people saying, well, the bounds globally are not well put, maybe nationally we have them, but globally or the national is not working anymore. Why I want to mention this is that the state all the time has been engaging during that period of success to find ways of correcting, error correcting by the state and finding ways of doing this. Now, if you think of why is this successful, it's not simply because capitalist zeal was, uh, was unlocked, the entrepreneurs could go ahead and, and we could get capitalism to thrive. But there was also something in society where there is fundamentally that those with power and influence, whether it's in politics, business, military, civil society, have an, in the end a shared commitment that growth with some broader uh, boundaries to it, call it development, that there is actually a shared commitment to it. That, that actually these rules of the game are a reflection of this shared commitment rather than anything else. And the way that we in, 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 in richer society have been evolving and looking for these new and, and in the end, you know, the way I would read uh, Paul's book on the future of capitalism is, a, is about, you know, what would that nature be of that shared commitment going forward? What would that nature be? But another part that's quite important is you need the nature of a state of a particular, uh, of a particular type. You know, you need a state that is self-aware. This is not about being a big state or a small state, but it's actually that within the context, in that context of its own shared commitment in its own uh, reality is actually quite self-aware, not doing too much or, or not doing too little. You know, we can't all, and that's an important thing, the whole world cannot be run like China because we do not have all over the world 3,000 years of centralized civil service with taxation and so on. We have actually all kinds of contexts that we need to be aware of. And the state that is being self-aware is quite important. And I think actually the success of capitalism is that the state was quite self-aware, trying to find ways of correcting. Yes, it was all messy, but there was a form of error correction through political and bureaucratic means. And not just pure because there were elections, but much deeper ingrained that need for correction. Now these three things, the shared commitment, a state that is quite self-aware and error correction, it's probably helpful to actually go and have a look what's happening in Africa in recent times. And I would argue there is actually not just one little model, and maybe this is where I would uh, want to have a discussion with Celestan, because I think it's not unique and everywhere the same, but you actually have these things that actually are playing out in different ways in different countries, which give me hope for some and actually no hope whatsoever for some others. Okay, I call this actually a growth and or development bargain. There is somehow an elite commitment to make it work and to actually get something that is a long-term horizon where we have that shared commitment to growth, where capitalism, whatever form it will take, can function within it. Whether it's the Chinese style, in particular types of states, the Korean style, or indeed the Western style of it. Now, it's quite important and briefly to go back to the state because you know, it is important, if we go back to that definition, to ask, ask the question, well, who owns that state? To whom is it accountable? You know, and you can very easily change here the definition a little bit to something like an alternative definition. It's an economic and political system in which the country, state and industry, as well as the state, are controlled by private owners for profit. Now, this is, I think, what Max Weber was talking about when he was talking about the patrimonial state. And this is probably what North means by the closed access state. It's totally captured as another extreme where the, where the state is just controlled by the private owners uh, for profit, and there is none of that kind of separation. I think that Celestine is alluding to, the lack of separation between the state and, and, the, and the business and so on. Now, one thing though that I want to then emphasize is that I don't believe, and I think North is unhelpful at times, I wouldn't dare to say this too much, but, but it's unhelpful by just saying, either you open or you're closed. And in fact, it's quite, uh, quite difficult for me to read some of these passages saying there's 30 countries that sorted it out and the rest is all a mess. I just don't think so. Even if you just think of those listening from the UK, um, what's happening today, you know, 
formal and informal structures of the state are all the time interacting in this case with text messages to the senior politicians. It's not as if, oh, it's all perfectly open or it's perfectly closed. All states are these mixtures. It's all about how far does this mixture go and does it tip the balance and get us actually going at some point. So, so in a sense, it's not a simple dichotomy as in North. Uh, Africa doesn't all have it, or indeed, as Simogli Robinson, who simplified, he took that and simplified entirely, includes his first exclusive institutions, and then saying, and it's all coming from history, where you basically, the only thing you can ever tell to a country, I'm very sorry, you should buy yourself a better history because that's the end of your, hist for, of your thing, of your destiny. And so surely there's something more. And what it ignores is actually the agency of the present day elite. I don't like to just say it's the leaders, it's actually that elite. It's that broader group of people. They have acted, they can act. And that's what we see. We see African countries, at times it comes together, it may break down, it hasn't come together again, and we have good periods and so on. And in the final bit, I just want to give here a suggestion. This is where my animals come into it. And it's basically, you know, if we think of what are these elements to get capitalist or entrepreneurial zeal to work, you want probably something what is in the left hand side there, this growth bargain, something that gives it that shared elite commitment, a self-aware state, and a format of, of, of error correction within your system. Now, you know, building on the work by Weber, Christopher Clapham, the, the, the brilliant economic historian uh, and political scientist, talks about neo-patrimonial state. It becomes this perceived thing that political scientists talk about it. It's basically where you say, well, the formal and informal structures are so interwoven that you're not quite sure what you see. And when you look at it, you may see the formal structures of an election, of a, of a parliament and so on. And Celestin was alluding to the courts in that respect. But then underneath it is this massive big thing that you don't really see. This is why I call it the hippo states, because you only see the ears and, um, and you don't really see the rest of the body floating there in the river. So, you, in fact, there's an expression in Afrikaans, you only see the hippo ears, that is literally means you only see the tip of the iceberg. And it's quite natural that also in Sierra Leone and other African countries, we get that expression. There's no icebergs in Africa, uh, icebergs in Africa. So, so it's basically medio patronal. And if you think of it, it's possible that elite may well want to do it. The state, though, is just harder to function because that nature of that state with all that informal network is always easily captured by clientelism and patronage. Error correction happens, but usually with the help of outside forces bringing the IMF or something through a crisis, you have to do it. You just do not have the self-correcting forces. So I would say in recent times, Sierra Leone and Malawi, it doesn't really look good and you basically don't get much. But I would say with the constitutional reform in Kenya, it's a patrimonial state, no doubt, or a neo-patrimonial state. But by decentralizing, pick it up the mayor at some point, decentralizing corruption by having constitutional reform that, uh, that actually it's not just one bite uh, that you can have, you know, you can have your time to eat even if you lose the national elections, you can actually go down. Think of Uganda under the early parts of Museveni, it's probably altered down a bit. But, you know, the man wanted to be there forever. So that was really had to have a long term. And he was willing to listen to Paul and other people with all the advice. Or think of Ghana, finding a political system that at least brings in a correction mechanism that takes that all the time out of the picture. OK, so that's that's one group. But you do have states that are looking a bit more like tiger fish. You know, I like the tiger fish. It, it reminded me of there was the prime minister of of uh, Congo at the time, Ponyo, told me, said, we want to be a tiger. And I don't know why I had the wit to say it. I think you rather are a tiger fish, because if you look up in the dictionary, what is a tiger fish? It's a fish that lives of eating little fish and it swims in the Congo River. So that's basically the only thing it does. And it's, it's basically where a state, there's no shared commitment, it's predation, clientelism. Nigeria moves between hippos and tiger fish and so on. And it can all break down dramatically to, to the thing. You could also try to do it on this kind of state-led type of thing. And that's the final thing I want to say is maybe a bit more like these lions, you know, Rwanda, Ethiopia. There is a shared elite commitment. Maybe the only problem is that the elite is pretty small because they kept an awful lot of groups out. And that gives it a bit of a question mark. But if you look at East Asia, that's probably how it started. It definitely... Uh, can actually do a much more self-aware state, and it definitely tries to do some of these corrections. Error correction, though, and we see this in Ethiopia, which makes it a bit tricky, 
regime change and so on is hard to handle. And indeed, the current regime clearly saw that it had to open up the economy because the state is not so strong to keep totally controlling. But of course, politics is there as well. And I would say Tanzania thought it was going to be a line on the Nyerere, but was a total failure. Anyway, this is um, the kind of thing. But it, for me, what to suggest is these are all mixtures of this kind of formal and informal, these mixtures of this open and closed access order that tries to find ways of, of evolving. And I think it actually gets us something there. It also tells us, and that's the real final slide, what to do. Well, what is it that we can do to get a shared elite commitment to maybe work better as outsiders? Can we improve the chances of the success of this elite? Can we actually get that state being more self-aware? I believe strongly in having the pocket of excellence in central banks and so on to help also with the error correction. And this is one of the big improvements we've had. Anyway, uh, and this is essentially trying to get towards more a growth and development bargain. Of course, it's all very hard. And that's is a bit like, you know, all of this is a gamble for the elite to rather than go for short term rent sh sharing, to actually go for something more for the long run with more pain and gain in the short term. And that actually makes it so hard, which is also why I think it is very much about can we help the odds of these gambles in the future? And so, yeah, anyway, so I've written something about it, but it will come out soon. Stefan. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. That was another fascinating and superb presentation. So, um, uh, uh, Chris, you've got the um, unenviable task uh, of, uh, of trying to respond and, uh, into, the, into these two superb and stimulating presentations. Over to you. Well, thank you, Paul. And uh, thank you, Sir Stan and, and Stefan. Um, two great presentations. And certainly uh, in the kind of six and a half minutes I've got, not an opportunity to, uh, um, to summarize them in any great detail. On a practical level, let me say, Celestin, that um, uh, I'll make a few comments on the, the presentation and the paper, but I will give you uh, sort of full written up comments on your paper uh, uh, in, in due course. Um, I think the first thing that I would say is that there's a lot of complementarity here between the two presentations and a lot of opportunity, I think, um, for you uh, in uh, your Oxford paper, Celestin, to, to draw on uh, some of the stuff that Stefan has presented. Because I think uh, reading your paper and listening to the presentation, there's an awful lot of common ground there that, that can, I think, be, uh, can be developed. Um, I think this uh, characterization of, of shared commitment self-awareness and error correction is actually quite a useful framework to, um, to wrap around a number of the issues that you raised uh, uh, in your paper um, as well, Celestine. Let me pick up on, I guess, one point that I wanted to, to reflect on in your presentation, Celestine, and then um, turn it back to the two of you with, with three questions. Um, and the observation is, um, a statement that you make in a number of places about the kind of intrinsic characteristic of capitalism to generate risk and uncertainty um, uh, for societies. And it seems to me that there's, there's a lot more to that. There's, there's an uh, important to distinguish between, in a sense, those shocks and risks that are intrinsic to the system that are generated by the nature of the system. You talked about the system that encourages risk taking, for example. From the capacity of the system to respond to shocks that originate from, from outside. Um, and I think this is particularly true in the, uh, in the African setting. And for those two types of kind of risk and shock to think about over what horizons they manifest themselves. Um, is at some point you're talking about kind of deep um, kind of centrifugal pressures in the system that lead to divergence, that lead to inequality, that lead to um, these sharp distinctions between those that can accumulate and those that can't. Um, and sometimes the issue is about short-term shocks and the management of short-term shocks. And I guess we're lucky this afternoon to have Paul chairing this because in a sense, one of the great natural experiments that probably all three of us started out our careers reading about was the 
controlled open economy story about the way in which uh, in the distinction between Kenya and Tanzania in response to a turn to trade shock that was exogenous to both, uh, both economies, how different systems responded to the same shock differentially. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a case where, in a sense, the, the properties of the system are about um, risk mitigation and risk response, as opposed to being the generator of, of underlying uh, um, pressures towards divergence. I think drawing that out in your paper might be quite a useful, um, useful thing to do. But let me move to where I think you, in the paper, I think you kind of hid your light uh, under a bushel somewhat. And that is the, um, the final section where you introduce in the paper and then because of the shortage of time in the presentation, rather quickly at the end about uh, what's in the paper you call sort of structural economic policies, um, or that's, sorry, that's not the right phrase. You call it um, uh, the new structural economics. Um, and that is, is central to your argument about the resurrection in your title. We, there's a lot in the, the obituary part, which I think everybody will, will agree with. The resurrection stuff is where the really interesting part of the paper comes in, but I think you do yourself a disservice by not expanding that nearly as much as you could. And this, what I'm going to say, picks up a little bit on what Stefan said in his opening remarks, is that actually at, at some level, you're demonstrating quite a lot of confidence in the system as it currently exists. You describe, for example, the role of external agency. It, um, you've got a quote that says, this is our best hope of, of mobilizing resources at the global level to support um, Sub-Saharan Africa, the, the kind of um, the IFI structures, the multilateral development banks, the existing structures, uh, you you argue are are well placed to be the principal mobilizer resources. I'd like to see that argument developed a little bit more. If they are quite so successful, what are the challenges they're facing now? Why do we not see the resource flow that you you are arguing is uh, is required? Um, and then the second issue, as I say, is, is I think you want to um, really say a lot more about, in a sense, what the new structural economics brings to the diagnosis of the current challenges of capitalism in Africa and the prognosis in terms of um, the, the kind of specifics of intervention, both at the domestic and the, the regional level that, that will help to um, address some of the deep tensions that you, you've identified. And let me finish with, with a couple of questions for both of you, um, which pick up a little bit from um, Stefan's presentation. Um, and that's to explore a little bit further the dynamics um, of this, this typology that um, uh, we've got our kind of hippos, tiger, fish, lion. Where, where do the kind of graduating hippos and the graduating lions, where do they move and how do they move and to what extent, I think you touched on it towards the end, Stefan, that to what extent does success undermine the shared interest? To what extent does success challenge the error correction mechanisms? And you, you started to talk a little bit about that in the context of Ethiopia that the recognition that in a sense to maintain the resource inflow requires certain actions that arguably uh, change the dynamics of, of the, the um, uh, I was going to call it the encompassing interest, but the, the self-interest of the elite and, and threatens that, um, uh, that security. Um, it's 2.59, Paul, I'll stop there. There's lots more I could say, but. Maybe there's a minute or two for Celestine and Stefan to respond quickly. I think there is, but uh, um, Celestine, you've had a lot of questions thrown at you and you've got the whole of two minutes to answer them. So you might be a little selective. Certainly, no, I will uh, first thank uh, uh, Chris uh, for his comments and thoughts. Uh, I've benefited from these comments uh, uh, for many years. I remember 
when I was at the African Development Bank as Vice President Chief Economist, I would never put out a macro economic report without getting a written comment from Chris Adams. Uh, Chris Adams on, on, on what uh, macro chapter. So very thoughtful, uh, interesting comment. Let me just pick um, maybe uh, one uh, since you insisted on that one. The, what would the new structural economics bring to uh, the current discussion of capitalism in Africa? Well, to me, um, one of the uh, reasons, I mean, there are many reasons why Africa hasn't done very well in terms of uh, digesting capitalism. And, I mean, I've, I listed a few of them. But uh, at the practical level, um, we have tried in Africa to copy um, very often the wrong models. If you are the prime minister of Burundi and you think of yourself as a, a landlocked country, you pick a successful landlocked country like Switzerland, and then you say, let me get his, his, their institution, their policies, and so on. Well, uh, the banking system or the financial market in Switzerland may not be appropriate for Burundi, given its current level of development. I think that new structural economics bring this conversation on the model, the appropriateness of uh, uh, policies and strategies based on the current level of development really into focus. Uh, um, uh, and then uh, second thing, and then I'll, I'll end there. Um, by definition, low income countries have very limited resources. Even advanced economies have very limited resources. Low income countries. So you need to be extraordinarily strategic in the way you use your resources, whether they are financial resources or human resources. Also. And by trying to do everything at the same time, uh, not privatizing and picking you know, industries and sectors randomly or by politicians or by whoever uh, business person is politically connected, doesn't help. Um, what you need to do is weave the private sector, the private sector, finding the niches where your endowment structure, labor capital ratio makes you more competitive and then finding the niche where you can really be a force. And then if you have the economy of scale through regionalization in Africa, uh, producing across boundaries, uh, the national boundaries and so on, then your market is a global market. You can be Burundi, but your market is not the market of Burundi, it's the global market. And I think that new social economics also helps uh, uh, make that uh, conversation more, more focused. But thank you very much for all your comments. That would be very, very useful as I revise the paper. Thank you, Celesta. Uh, Stefan, one minute. Yes, I'd, I'd, I'd try in a minute, yes. So thank you, Chris, and that's an excellent point. I mean, it, you know, you're absolutely right that that shared commitment needs to hold, and so you need to find a way that this actually is, let's say, in game theory, a short-term, but also a long-term equilibrium, that it actually it is a stable equilibrium in that sense. And so this is actually probably why I'm arguing here also is that you know, that the whole economic deal that exists and the political deal need to be consistent with each other. I just find a strike, let me give three very quick examples. One is, if you think in China, when Deng Xiaoping was opening up, up the economy, you know, he had to be, there was an incredible political gamble. If you now look at the records, who argued very strongly for the repression during Tiananmen Square, it was Deng Xiaoping. And so he had to keep that political deal together at all costs. And at all costs was that's the only way that economic deal could work. The reverse is also, think of Indonesia, which I find a really interesting example here, is that during, uh, during the you know, late, uh, the early uh, 2000 South Asian crisis with the transition, you, you needed to find a way to keep the old elite in it. Now, one person who never really got pushed out was, was Madame Tien cents, Madame Tien, uh, Ten cents, you know, this was the Y of Suharto, who always took 10% on all infrastructure programs. That is the old elite, while there's a new incumbent elite coming in there at the same time, you need to keep on working that. And in, uh, in Indonesia, it had to be solved by actually allowing them to be paid off. This is a bit like in Ethiopia, where I want to allude to, is to saying, you know, in these lying states, the underlying shared commitment is unfortunately held by a very small elite. Yep. And indeed, one that came to power in one day in Ethiopia, representing a minority interest. They may have tried, but actually just economic progress doesn't usually buy enough legitimacy. And we, you know, I, I'd hoped it didn't come to that, but that's also what's there. And you need to have that political and economic deal working together. So what you do about it is also a bit like towards us. 
we focus all the time about de-risking economic progress, de-risking the economy and so on. We need to find a ways of de-risking the politics as well, because actually these two things will come together. Thank you, all three of you. It's been a great session. Um, let me summarize in one minute that there's been too much attention on the dream of the perfect long term, uh, the replication of Switzerland, um, the instant replication. Um, all these are transitions starting from fragility, starting from very low capacity. And this, the transitions have to work step by step, starting from where you are with the capacities you've got, and they have to work every step of the way. Uh, the path to the long-term goal is the success at every moment of the short term. But on that note, thank you very much. We've had a fantastically good session. Um, and thank you as an audience for, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, Paul.